This morning, I want to talk about the lesson of the hour is pitching our tents towards Sodom. Our lesson text is taken from Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 to 13 as well. I want to reread what Brother Russell just read in our hearing and make some application and say some things about these words. And here is the time, the context is given to us about the time when Abraham, who took his, his, his nephew Lot with him, and they're traveling together. And the time is when the, the livestock, because they have so much with them, there's barely any room or barely any water and grass for them both, so they decide to separate. And that's where we pick up with verse 8. Actually, verse 8 tells us, So Abraham, Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. For we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate your separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of Jordan. that was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. Now we'll stop there. Verse 10 is actually making a comment about something that hasn't happened yet. He said, before God destroyed it, this was a beautiful place, a well-watered place, and it was a very fertile place, as we understand the language of verse 10 as well. Now, pick up verse 11, says, So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separate from each other, Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents, or as the King James pitched his tents, as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. And so you see the decision that Lot made as he will say, well, I want to go this way. And Abram went the other direction. Now our lesson is very simple this morning. What happens after that decision? That's what we're going to talk about now. As we know, there are the tragic results of living in wicked Sodom. And when the Bible refers to pitching their tents towards something, if you notice, even the Bible tells us that Abram pitched his tents. He pitched his tents in the opposite direction of the way that Lot went. But because he did in that direction, eventually he came to live in the land of Sodom as well. And we're going to see how that there were some very tragic results of that. First of all, because God saw the wickedness of Sodom and sought to destroy it. If you pick up in Genesis chapter 18, let's turn over there if you will. Just a few chapters down from this, you'll find out that Abraham meets the Lord. And you might say some angels here that are with the Lord. And chapter, chapter 18, verse 16. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, shall I, have, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him to make command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what is spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which ha has come to me. And if not, I will know. And all, then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham was standing before the Lord. And this is where Abraham begins to say, well, are you going to destroy the world, destroy this, these cities with the righteous? He talks about here in verse 23, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous who are in it? Evidently, this was some big, these were big cities. And of course, Abraham is thinking, surely there must be 50 righteous people there who are not doing according to all the city. And then God said, Far be it 
from you to do such a thing. Abraham says this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And truly, that's good words, isn't it? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, now behold, I venture to speak to the Lord, although I am, am but dust and ashes. And that again shows his humility. Abraham was humble before God, as, as we all should be. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I venture to speak to the Lord. In verse 28, Suppose the 50 righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy this whole city because of five? And he said, I will destroy it. Not will not destroy it for the, if I find 45 there. It goes down from 45 all the way down to 10 righteous souls. And the Bible says in verse 33, as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. Now, that gives us kind of the background. Here, Abraham is bargaining with God, starts out with 50 and 45, and then on down to 10 righteous. You know, that shows us really how wicked, in some ways, that city was because they could not even find 10 righteous souls there in that city. And so we pick up the fact that Abraham sought to save that city, verses 30, 23 to 33. And then we find Lot's experience at Sodom. And that's really what chapter 19 is all about. If we look and see that the Bible tells us there was two angels, verse 1 tells us, came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, we will spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, it doesn't say specifically, but, you know, as Lot was living there, he knew what these people were about. He knew what they would do and their wickedness. Because the Bible is very plain about that, that Lot knew exactly what kind of city he was living in. He was sitting at the gate, and he, that's why he urged them to come into his house because of the wickedness that was there. And the Bible even tells us, verse 4 says, Before they lay down, the men of the city, the city of the Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Your translation, we may know them. That's basically saying in some, you might say, idiom of saying to have physical relations of a sexual nature, which is perverted, as God would say. And the Bible goes on to say here, But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. So this was not like some have tried to say, Well, these people tried to simply get to know these two angels, get to know them in a social way. No, that's not at all. Because why would he offer his two daughters? He's going about to do that in just a few moments. He says in verse 8, now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. Now, we don't look at that decision of Lot as something good. He's maybe choosing the lesser of two evils here. But still, I don't agree with his attitude of offering his two daughters to them. That was something that was not right in that sense. People sometimes, righteous people, make mistakes. And I believe it was that in this regard. Even the offer there was wrong. But notice it says in verse 9, But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, This one came in as an alien, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house, with them and shut the door. In other words, Lot had to retreat back into the house. 
They struck the men who were with him at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whoever you have in the city. Bring them out of this place. We're about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now, we looked at the rest of these verses in different lessons. And we all know what happens from this point on. But it needs to be said, doesn't it? That they delayed for some time. The angels grabbed them by the arms and said, you need to escape from the city and don't look back. And yet, that's exactly what happened when Lot's wife looked back. She turned into a pillar of salt. And Lot, only Lot and his two daughters were the ones who escaped the city because God rained down fire and brimstone upon the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we might ask the question, why did God do that? Well, again, God is a righteous God who cannot bear sin. And that's one of the things we know very plainly several times in the scriptures. The Genesis flood in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 is all because of wickedness. God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth in that period of time. But also in this period was a different kind of sin, you might say, or one that just the Bible speaks of specifically of the sin of homosexuality and that this was the problem here. These men of the city wanted the two men that were there in Lot's house. And that was wrong for that to take place. And Lot was right to guard these two men from this wickedness. Now we might even question, why did Lot pitch his tents towards Sodom in the first place? And you may think, well, he finds out that the city's like this and he becomes living with them. I want to suggest Lot used poor judgment in his decision to live in Sodom. And he may, you know, looking back on this, we can see things with clarity. With clarity, uh, They say hindsight is twenty twenty, And I'm sure when Lot was, is in that cave with his two daughters, he's thinking, well, you know, this all shouldn't have took place. I wish I'd never made that decision to go the route that I went in. But sometimes after the fact, it's too late, isn't it? That's why the Bible gives us examples and gives us the reasons about what happened and why all this took place to give us wisdom not to go down the same road that others have gone down. You know, it began when he looked more to the physical than the spiritual side. You may think, well, what was that decision? Looking back on this, going back to Genesis chapter 13, again, one of the mistakes there. Chapter 13, verses 12 and 13. The Bible tells us there, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. We may ask the question later on, how did he get there? It was a progression, wasn't it? The enduring word commentary says this about what happened in this book. It says there was a steady progression of compromise in Lot's life. He went from looking toward Sodom in Genesis 13, verse 10, to pitching his tent toward Sodom in verse 12, to living in Sodom, Genesis 14, verse 12, and losing everything when Sodom was attacked. Now, that's one of the things. He had to make a decision. You know, when Lot was captured, Abraham rescued him. And you think, well, why would Lot even still stay there, knowing how wicked the city was, after losing everything while he was attacked. But now, back in the infamous city, Lot saw in the gate, or Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, indicating he was a civic leader. In the Old Testament, in Old Testament times, the person that was sitting in the gate of the city was an important person. They were like a, a officer or someone who of great importance, a judge in some ways. And that's exactly where Lot was. He was one of the leaders there in, sitting at the gate, watching those who come in and come out. And so that's where he was in his life. At first he saw all this place is well watered. 
I can have all this for my cattle. I won't have to struggle with all the things. You know, sometimes don't we make decisions based upon what benefits us physically rather than spiritually? When we're moving to another place, maybe to a big city, and we think about, is there a church there? Is there a place where I can meet with saints who are the people of God? And I can maybe, my family can, can have a better environment. Or we think, well, it'd be good for us financially to move to a big city or somewhere else. But what about the atmosphere, the environment? If we move to a place that benefits us physically and financially, but the place is morally bankrupt, we're kind of like law in some ways. We're thinking about more of the physical than the spiritual side of this. We asked the question at looking at Genesis 13, verse 13, how the God's looked at this as a wicked city. Why would a righteous man choose to ever live there? You know, we as people of God want to escape sin. I think that's one of the things the Bible tells us that as much as possible within us, we should not put ourselves in temptation or around those and fellowship those. And I don't think Lot was doing that particularly, but he was around people seeing that every day. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Actually, I want to go back to that. The Bible says there how he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them example to those who afterward would live godly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. That had to be a miserable situation. For someone, the Bible calls him a righteous man. When you're around people who are doing the wrong things, it doesn't make you feel like maybe I should get away from this person. Maybe I don't need to be around this person when they're doing these things. And that's a choice we can make. Sometimes we have no choice. Sometimes we're put with co-workers or, or in a situation where we cannot avoid people who are doing the wrong things. But Lot chose to go this direction. Lot made a decision to pitch his tents towards Sodom, and he lived there in Sodom. And so all that shows us how dangerous the situation by putting ourselves into that situation that it can be. Now, how are others making the same mistake today? If you look back on some of the things back in the yesteryear of times before us, back in the 50s and 60s, our nation was a nation that was morally more upright than it is now. Now some might say, well, that's the golden age of, of our morality as far as America is concerned. And it, it may well be because the times later on, the 60s especially, the times of the revolutions and things like that would take place. And people would go in wrong directions a lot of ways. And an attitude toward the same sin that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah has changed in this country. In the 50s and 60s, people stayed in the closet. Now they're out and they're proud. What we call this Pride Month, this month of June, which is really not anything to be proud of. It's because it's of sin. Many times people will say, well, their, their pride is why they're there. Why well, it's Pride Month because they're proud to be this way. They're born this way. No, they're not born this way. They have chosen to be this way. There's a pro progression of attitude toward the sin of homosexuality. It, it was once that we opposed it, calling it deviant and unlawful behavior and sinful. People were more on page with that than they are now today. It went from opposing it to silence, toleration of it, and refusal to call it sin. There was a very popular comedy show used to be on television all the time. And one of the things they had on there was someone, when they had actually a show that said several times in that particular episode that when somebody was gay, not that there was anything wrong with that. You may know the show I'm talking about. Well, that's the attitude of a lot of people today, that I'm not going to be that way, but I am not going to say anything's wrong with that. Well, that's how the progression went. 
the silence, not saying anything about it, toleration, refusing to call it sin, to condoning it, embracing it even, promoting and congratulating this sin. You think about in the last 10 or 15 years how things have changed in this country and all over the world really because the world has changed a lot in this way as well in coming out of, you might say, the morality of what used to be. But even God, even though God calls it sin. In Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, the Bible says, for this reason, he's talking about the Gentiles who left God. He says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even the women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned their lust for one another, men with men committing that which is shameful, receiving themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Sometimes people want to make light of this sin and say, well, it, it, it's not really a sin. And, and, and the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality and, and all the things that LGBTQ+, plus, no, how many letters they put on it? Three letters really describe it. S-I-N. It's sin. And I make no apologies for that because one of the things, it, it might be offensive to some, it's offensive to God. And He is the righteous one we have to be concerned about. It's not about me or anything about others. It, you know, sometimes Christians are made to be the bad person because we are speaking the truth, even if we do it in love, because that's really what I actually love the souls of all men. I want everybody to be saved, but not everybody's going to be saved until they come out of their sins and come to the Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jude verse 7, the Bible again says about Sodom and Gomorrah, as the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and gone after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I'm glad we can still speak the truth in this country. There may be a get to a point where we cannot speak the truth, but we can say what's right, call things as God calls things. And if God says, if this is an example of vengeance toward those who do those things, then we need to be able to speak that the truth and love toward others as well. And what the loving thing is, is, is to say, you know, we love you, God loves you, but you cannot stay in this sin if you want to be saved. You have to come out of it, repent of it, no longer practice it, and be saved. And so there's progression that happened in this country. And how others making the same mistake today, pitching our tents towards Sodom, corporations and businesses requires sensitivity training and cater to the LGBTQ plus uh, people. That, I was looking at in preparation of this lesson and studying for this lesson. How many corporations are actually caused? Maybe you have seen this as well in schools and things like that. They're requiring people to learn about pronouns and things like that. Make sure you get the right pronouns and, and call people by what they want to be called. Well, that's really a wokeism going to rise when it comes to this idea. Because a man is still a man and a woman is still a woman. And we need to realize there's only two genders, male and female. As God created them in the beginning, so created them, male and female. And when they require these kind of things, I know we have to have a job. I know there's times we have to go through this, but we know what the Bible says about these things. And there are four states, sadly this is the case, there are four states that require LGBTQ history to be taught in their schools. And they are California, New Jersey, Colorado, and Illinois. I'm not the, a prophet or a son of a prophet, but I want to tell you, when it starts out like this, eventually it may even go to all 50 states require this kind of LGBTQ history be taught in their schools. Now, why are they teaching this in the first place? It's because they want to get our children indoctrinated 
into this idea and even mess with them think well maybe i'm a male trapped in a female's body or a female trapped in a male's body no you're exactly what god made you you're male and female or male or female i should say and you cannot be one or the other you cannot choose your gender as well we know that's simply something that the world says is true but god says that's not the case and I say that with love because I want people to come out of this confusion, if you will. And sadly, some churches have bought into this. They've abandoned biblical morality and embraced the LGBTQ community. One thing I have to say about this is churches, in some respect, I don't know what they're preaching in the pulpit. I may look and see what kind of sermons they're talking about. What they're not talking about is the sin. And why people need to repent. They're not preaching it as sin or calling sinners to repent like Jesus did. You know, Jesus, he did not mix words, did he? With the Pharisees, the scribes, the, the hypocrites as he called them. And he, he called them out for their sins and things they were doing wrong. He would do the same today. If you were here, he would talk about some of the things people do today. The Episcopal Church is one of these. You can look up how many churches really are LGBTQ friendly. You can find out very easily like I did. I just looked it up and, and found went to the Episcopal Church website. And I found this. They're very proud to be supporters of them. It says, we believe in following the teachings of Jesus Christ, whose life, death, and resurrection saved the world. We have a legacy of inclusion, aspiring to tell and exemplify God's love for every human being. Ordination and the offices of bishop, priest, and deacon are open to all without discrimination. Lay people and, and clergy cooperate as leaders at all levels at our, of our church. Leadership is a gift from God and can be expressed by all people in our church, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, or gender identity or expression. We believe that God loves us all, no exceptions. I say that's, that's sad that churches have gone down this road of, of embracing fully this type of sin. That's exactly what it is. It's still sin, no matter what people will say about it today. And you know, that's not just the Episcopal Church, but it's other churches as well. The United Church of Christ, not to be confused with the Church of Christ, but the United Church of Christ is one of those, is also like this. I have another quote from them. This is on one of the websites I looked at. It says, the United Church of Christ is recognized as one of the most welcoming and affirming Christian denominations celebrating same-sex marriages since 2005. Now, I'm going to ask the question, why didn't they do it before that? Well, again, that's how things change, isn't it? And ordaining LGBTQ pastors since 1972, numbering more than 5,000 churches and close to a million members, the UCC core values include an extravagant welcome in the affirmation, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. And I say shame with shame. That's, that's not biblical Christianity. There's others like the United Methodist Church was actually going through somewhat split of this kind of, of this thing. And others who are, I would say, t pitching their tents towards Sodom and abandoning Christian basic Bible morality when it comes to living the Christian life. Now I want to say this at the end of the lesson. How do we react to this? Do we protest in the streets? Do we go out there and with billboards and things like that and march and, and do all kinds of, of, of things in this way? No, I want to tell you what we need to do is believe and hold the truth, stand fast and teach it to our children what's right, what's not right, and stay with the Lord. You know, they mentioned the Lord and how He saved people. You know how he saves people? He wants to get rid of the sin problem. He wants to get rid of our sins and until churches can actually call it a sin, people are still going to practice it. People are still say, well, I'm a homosexual Christian. And really, in reality, they're not Christ-like at all. 
I say that not out of pride, but I say it humbly because people need to know these things. We are faced with this pride situation. And this month, you're going to see a lot of things. A lot of things people happen. Maybe the White House lighting up with the rainbow colors again. I don't know. All the things that happen. But I do know this. I know the Lord does not like this because of what He did at Sodom and Gomorrah. And He still feels that way today, doesn't He? That's why we need to live righteous lives before Him. That's why we need to give up our sins. If someone's here today who's not a child of God, we talked about primarily about this one sin, what caused the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed, but there's other sins. You know, the sin of adultery, just as bad as this. The sin of lying, just as bad. Murder is just as bad. And fornication is just as bad. All those sins will cause us to lose our place in heaven. But what we need to do is repent and be baptized. If you've never obeyed the gospel, faith in Jesus Christ, repentance of your sins, confession of Him, and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins. We can help you do that this morning and live for the Lord the rest of your days. Why don't you come as together we stand and we sing the song has been selected. <clears throat>